bacteria. They're everywhere. They're invisible to the human eye, and they're incredibly prolific. In just one milliliter of fresh water, there are a million of them. In a single gram of soil, over 40 million. Together, they weigh more than all the plants and animals in the world. Humans may think they rule the world, but in reality, they're just lodgers on a planet whose first inhabitants were bacteria. All living beings are covered with them, on the inside as well as the outside. In a human body, there are a hundred trillion of them. We're actually more bacterial than human by about 10 to 100 fold. We truly are, are less human than we think. Bacteria are generally very misunderstood. People think bacteria mean illness, but that's not true at all. In fact, very few bacteria are dangerous to humans. The fact is, the relationship that plants and animals have to bacteria is often beneficial to both. These beneficial relationships are called symbioses. I can't think of a single animal that's not symbiotic, especially us. We couldn't live without our bacteria. Symbiosis has played a fundamental role in the evolution of life. We found out during the course of the 20th century that associations between symbiotic species were more common than we thought and are definitely one of the greatest motors of evolution. down at the bottom of the ocean lies the mysterious world of the abyss. Here in the greatest desert in the world, there's no plant life and very few animals. But when in the 1970s, oceanographers discovered the first deep sea vents, the phenomenal amount of animal life they found there in an environment hitherto thought hostile to all life forms, raised a lot of questions. Could bacteria really survive in such extreme conditions? Were they responsible for this profusion of life? Could symbiosis explain these creatures' extraordinary success? To find answers to these questions, the Biobaz Oceanographic Expedition, founded and led by Professor Francois Lallier of the Roscoff Biological Station in Brittany, took us in search of secrets hidden since the dawn of time, many fathoms beneath the sea. We're on course for some volcanic sites out in the middle of the Atlantic. There are 32 scientists on board, and they're all experts on deep sea vents biology. The state of the art technology of their remote controlled robot, Victor 6000, will enable them to minutely explore the volcanoes of the Mid Atlantic Ridge. 
Victor can dive to depths of six kilometers. It's setting off into a world of total darkness, heading for one of the most spectacular deep sea vents on the planet, Rainbow, which lies at a depth of 2,300 meters. It's hard to get close to Rainbow, Powerful geysers constantly pump out gigantic swirls of scalding liquids into the abyss. of highly acidic fluids, their chemical composition a long list of toxins, each more dangerous than the other. Yet, here at these geysers, there swarms an impressive quantity of animal life. Right here, among all the chimney systems created by the geysers, hides the first creature the scientists want to study, the Rimicaris shrimp. These chimneys, covered in cracks, are the only ones that release their fluids gently and regularly enough to provide the shrimps with ideal living conditions. The Rimicaris huddle into the channels of volcanic fluids, dancing together in an eternal ballet, as if in defiance of the most extreme conditions to be found anywhere on the planet. Aboard the boat, under the leadership of Marie-Anne Campbell and Magalise Binden, everyone's getting ready for the catch. They're hoping for a haul of a hundred Rimikari shrimps. It's easy to catch them. You just hoover them up. Coming up to the surface, the animals will suffer the traumatizing effects of violent decompression. Down here at 2,300 meters, the pressure is 230 bars. That's 230 kilos per square centimeter. At the surface, the atmospheric pressure is just one kilo per square centimeter. We ourselves are organisms that contain gas. If we are compressed to 300 bars, our thoracic cage is immediately squashed, which of course means instant death. Fortunately, these deep sea organisms contain no gases. It's more a question of the fluidity of cellular membranes. 
We know that if we vary pressure, then fluidity varies too. And membranes hold all an organism's channels of transmission, neural transmission, chemical transmission, etc. From the moment you disturb any of an organism's membrane passages, if the variations in pressure are too much, the organism will die. At sea level pressure, the Rimikari shrimps of the rainbow vent cannot survive longer than a few days. But their anatomy still remains intact enough to be studied. Dissection of their digestive tube reveals the first enigma of these creatures' strange way of life. Apart from a few morsels of rock that they've nibbled here and there, their intestines contain no food at all. The shrimp's digestive system doesn't appear to play a major role in their feeding habits. So what, then, do they live on? The researchers naturally turned their attention to the strange crustacean's enormous head. The head takes up half the creature's body. That's very big. Normally, it's not even a third. When they're very young, they look like ordinary shrimps. And at a certain point in their development, they metamorphose, a bit like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. The head becomes so enormous, and the shell too, that the shrimp can't graze anymore and can't feed. No wonder the digestive tube's almost empty. As for the huge head, that's due to the terrific size of the chamber that holds the gills, the animal's respiratory organ. When they take a look inside that chamber, the biologists get a big surprise. There are billions of bacteria living there. The bacteria have to get into the gill cavity, so that creates really long filaments. And they also get into the scaphognophyte, which is a kind of blade that pulsates in the cephalothoracic cavity to create a current of water and has long bristles on it that are covered in bacteria. Microbiological analysis shows that these resident bacteria are always the same species. In the absence of a true, functioning digestive system, the researchers wonder if, when it comes to food, there isn't a relationship between the shrimps and their vast colonies of bacteria. A kind of symbiosis, even. But to find out more about this strange relationship, you have to work with healthy shrimp specimens that haven't been through the shock of decompression. And that's what Bruce Shalito's team intend to do on a second trip to the Rainbow site with the help of a revolutionary new high-pressure aquarium system. To thrive with such success in such different environments, bacteria must have an amazing ability to adapt. The next step of the mission will be to verify this hypothesis at another site. So the course is set for Lucky Strike, another volcano discovered in 1992, down at a depth of 1,700 meters.
The deep sea geysers at Lucky Strike aren't as powerful as the ones at Rainbow, so they haven't developed those spectacular tall black and gray chimneys. Over the decades, they have simply built up a succession of little hills. whitish carpets that surround the Lucky Strike geysers are actually vast colonies of bacteria, visible to the naked eye. The first thing you notice are these big layers of microbes, like big yellowish white carpets that cover the sediments of the seabed and the ends of the chimneys. And the extraordinary thing is that they're actually long filaments that float in the current. These carpets of bacteria are flirting dangerously with the scalding emissions of fluid. Probes placed by the team right inside the chimneys show temperatures of over 350 degrees. But as they mix with the seawater that's at only three or four degrees, within the space of less than a meter, the temperature of the fluids drops to less than 30 degrees, thus creating conditions that favor the development of most species of bacteria. The chemical composition of the fluids, though, presents all the characteristics of an environment hostile to most life forms. They are highly acidic and contain radioactive elements, heavy metals, and highly toxic molecules such as sulfurs. From our point of view, of course, what with the pressure, the temperature, and the chemicals, because there are plenty of compounds there that would be toxic to animal life, the conditions look extreme. For these bacteria, it's simply their habitat, and they're fine there. <laughs> Researchers have discovered that the bacteria feast on the volcanic fluids as if they were nectar. All those toxic elements, deadly poisons for us, are for them a source of nourishment. Obviously, we find our human environment a more welcoming place than a volcanic abyss. But these bacteria have no need of a human body. They're quite at home here. Not many scientists know more about the role bacteria play in our lives than Laura Hooper. In some ways, we can consider the intestine and maybe even the skin an extreme environment in that these bacteria have to cope with an immune system, for example, that's lobbing grenades at them all the time. Um, they have to cope with shifts in pH as they travel through the stomach into the intestine and vast changes in diet. Bacteria's ability to survive is remarkable. For billions of years, they were the only living creatures to colonize the deep sea geysers. But across millions of years of evolution, some enterprising creatures from the surface have adapted to the conditions here and even managed to settle in permanently. So who are they, these pioneers? And how do they withstand the extreme conditions? Jose Sarrazin leads an animal ecology team that specializes in deep sea geysers. To gauge the capacity of animals to colonize new ground around the geysers, she has come with a system of artificial habitats made up of slate, wood, muslin, and even beef bones. <laughs> No, no, let's go, let's go. It's not going to do that. 
The whole range of them is laid out close to the fluids and recuperated sometimes a few days later, but more often the following year during the next expedition. In the space of just a few days, bacteria from the surrounding water have managed to settle on all the different habitats. In their turn, they have soon attracted dozens of local species of a particular kind of animal, the grazers. The first animals fed directly on the bacteria, just like cows at pasture. They came to graze the fields of bacteria. Millions of years ago, thanks to the bacteria that formed the basis of their diet, the very first animal species from the surface were able to survive in the vicinity of the deep sea geysers. There are little gastropods, little sea snails. There are also little amphipods, little crustaceans that graze on the bacteria. Colonization of the geysers of the abyss could have ended there with the grazers, content just to eat the bacteria they found without establishing any further relationship to them. But the grazers have had nothing like the success of other species that have gone on to develop gigantic colonies, species like the so-called Azorean deep mussels, which are particularly numerous at Lucky Strike. One of the aims of the Biobaz program is to find out the reasons for this exceptional success. The next dives of the robot Victor will be entirely dedicated to the in-depth study of the deep muscles way of life. As Vermicari shrimp are only to be found at depths of more than 2,000 meters, deep mussels are present wherever there are hot geysers. The Lucky Strike deep mussels are harvested at depths of less than 2,000 meters and stand up well to the decompression. The scientists can simply transport them in plexiglass boxes. What's most striking when you open a deep mussel is the sheer size of its gills. In this mussel, we found bacteria in the gills, and in great abundance, too. There are no bacterial filaments visible on the outside, though. Unlike with the Rimicari shrimp, the deep mussel bacteria live right inside the cells of the gills a very rare phenomenon. The cells on the surface of the thousands of little filaments that make up each gill have the specific task of growing internal bacteria. It's quite clear when seen through a fluorescent microscope, the nucleus of the cell is blue. The hundreds of little red and green blobs are all bacteria comfortably lodged right inside each specialized cell.
so the bacteria pull off the amazing feat of foiling the cell's immune systems to get inside them and once in, to stay there. The animal has to be able to regulate the rate of growth of the bacteria within its own cells. In certain types of cells, the bacteria are allowed, even encouraged, to develop. Whereas in all the other tissues, there are no symbiotic bacteria to be found at all. But the mussels don't merely accept the presence of the bacteria. They make sure that their guests can eat their fill. Mussels are in fact like filters. They circulate water through their gills. There's oxygen in this water as well as sulfurs, a bit of methane and a bit of dissolved carbon. So everything the bacteria need is there. And since the water is circulating, their environment is constantly being refreshed. This relationship between the bacteria and the mussels is most peculiar. It's as if, after millions of years of an intimate relationship, the bacteria were progressively becoming part of the very cells of the mussel. measure to what extent the deep muscles are dependent on the bacteria in the cells of their gills, the scientists at Biobaz are going to try a little experiment 1,700 meters under the sea. It consists of putting a few dozen muscles in cages at a distance from the source of the fluids. When we take them out of their natural habitat, the bacteria get no more sulfurs, no more methane, so they have nothing to live on. Away from the fluids, the bacteria cease to multiply and eventually disappear. And without their crop of bacteria, the mussels only survive for two or three days. What is the reason for this fundamental dependence? The gills are like their larder, where they grow their bacteria. Astonishing as it may seem, each of these specialized cells is constantly digesting within itself a small part of its personal stock of bacteria. We also think the bacteria are capable of releasing compounds. For example, as a bacteria grows up, it will release sugars around it, within the cell of the animal. By way of the blood circulation, molecules from the intracellular bacteria in the gills actually feed all the muscle's cells. So it's an especially close symbiosis between animal and bacteria. And it's the reason these deep muscles have done so well in such extreme conditions. An intracellular symbiosis like this is a very rare phenomenon in biology. It's an extremely important discovery since it demonstrates the fundamental role that bacteria have played in the most important phases of evolution. As long as two billion years ago, a symbiotic fusion of two bacteria in a process resembling that of intracellular symbiosis was possibly at the origin of the first cell with a nucleus. Soon after that, the incorporation of a bacteria enabled cells with nuclei to breathe oxygen and evolve ever more complex organisms, all the way up to mammals and to the human species. A few hundred million years later, it was once again symbiosis with the bacteria that would allow cells to photosynthesize and enable algae and all the Earth's vegetation to evolve.
So two of the most easily recognizable characteristics of plants and animals come from bacteria that they breathe, or in the case of plants, photosynthesize. These both originate from symbiosis with bacteria. These huge populations of symbiotic mussels became an important food source for other animals coming from the surface. This third type of animal was neither a grazer nor a symbiotic. They were predators, scavengers, and bottom feeders. They may be the spitting image of their cousins at the surface, but these carnivores have adapted so well to the extreme physical and chemical conditions here that they have become species specific to the deep sea geysers. Take the Mirokari shrimp, for instance, a distant cousin of the Rimikaris with its huge head, or the Segenzasia crab, both of them scavengers and bottom feeders. These native species spend their whole lives around the sources of volcanic fluids and are perfectly happy here. But at another nearby site, 800 meters deep, there's another large species of crab, the Chassian. This big crustacean doesn't live here at the geysers. It just drops by from time to time, drawn by all those muscles. Unlike the local crabs, the Chassians can't withstand the fluid emissions and often come away with painful burns. Their daring is rewarded with copious meals. Those huge banquets have their downside, though. All the creatures of the deep-sea geysers have had to get used to the presence everywhere, in the water and in their food, of a lot of toxins. Top of the list, hydrogen sulfide. There's always plenty of that in the fluids. It's what makes rotten eggs smell so bad. It's a molecule that, in contact with the air, gives off a very nasty smell. It's a molecule that, for an animal, for example, is highly toxic because it replaces the oxygen in the hemoglobins. So if you breathe in sulfur, it can asphyxiate you. So the local inhabitants have adapted to the need to detoxify these chemical elements. But what is the strange hair that most of the crabs seem to be covered with? Well, guess what? It's bacteria. Generally, if a bacteria can lodge itself on an animal, that means it's been accepted and will benefit the animal. When the bacteria draw on heavy metals or elements like sulfurs, they transform them in order to grow. And so what they put back into the environment is less toxic than what they took in. That's what we refer to as detoxification. The bacteria grow on the crabs because they like it there. It's like having their own chauffeur-driven ride, one that keeps them neither too near nor too far from those nourishing fluid streams. It is indeed a kind of external bacterial symbiosis.
We ourselves also wear an overcoat of bacteria, but ours is totally invisible. Our bodies contain 10 times more bacteria than cells. The mucous membranes of our respiratory system and genitals, as well as the insides of our digestive tube, are carpeted and the surface of our body covered with them. It's known that there are approximately a million bacteria per square centimeter of skin. And interestingly, if you wash your hands, that will go down, but only very temporarily. So 30 minutes later, they're all back. They are making their home there so that other pathogenic bacteria have, are less likely to be able to um, successfully colonize. Um, but they also stimulate the immune system of the skin, and so that confers some protection as well. Our best friends are the bacteria on our skin. In exchange, we feed them with the dead cells that are the product of the constant renewal of our epidermis. Just as with the crabs down in the abyss, it's a question of symbiosis, of mutual aid. Let's return to the rainbow cleft, where the Rimikari shrimp has carved out its little domain. To further their research on the relationship between the shrimps and the bacteria they carry in their outsized heads, the team needs to be able to observe some healthy specimens that haven't suffered the effects of such brutal decompression. Bruce Shildito's team has come up with a little technological jewel made up of two parts, periscope and baliste, that can bring shrimps up to the surface while maintaining the pressure from down below. It's a totally unique invention. It's the only machine that can connect with a cell that can itself harvest quite sizable animals. Of course, we're not talking about giant squid, but five centimeter shrimps is still pretty good. With food preservation, we talk about the cold chain, but here we're talking about the pressure chain. From the place they were caught right up to where they're studied, we maintain the pressure of the seabed and maintain the most natural conditions possible. Baliste, the more complex part of the system, stays on board the boat. Its impressive stainless steel structure weighs nearly 400 kilos and means it can recreate the extreme pressure conditions of the abyss. It works like an airlock, a bit like on a space shuttle, like a craft that comes and connects to the space station to supply it. We pressurize the water lock, the connection, then once everything's at the same pressure, we open the main valves just a quarter of a turn, and we can transfer the animals just by tipping it all in. The first into action, though, is periscope, the movable part. It is placed on the elevator, a freestanding module that shuttles up and down from the surface during Victor's dives, which can last up to 36 hours. The mission of the robot's pilots is to catch 20 Rimikari shrimps inside a sealed tube they call the periscopette. First stage accomplished. Victor straight away takes control of Periscope, which is a few hundred meters away on the elevator.
Fitting the periscopette full of shrimps into periscope's steel cylinder is the most delicate maneuver of the whole operation. Now it's just a case of closing the powerful valve that will maintain the deep sea pressure all the way to the surface. After a few minutes, the elevator casts off its ballast and its buoyancy carries it back up to the surface. Back on board, Bruce Shilito is preparing a cozy nest for his guests. Inside Baliste, the shrimps will be quite at home. The water is at eight degrees, and the pressure is around 230 kilos per square centimeter. Through the window of three centimeter thick sapphire, the scientists can observe the animals throughout the experiments. Okay. That's it. Watch the handle. <laughs> the last phase of the operation is to connect periscope to ballast without any loss of pressure. One, two, three. Is that good for you guys? On the trolley, there. Put it down gently. That's it. Okay. Put it where it usually goes so it'll be clear. It's not quite in the joint yet. Almost, almost. A bit further onto the plate. Keep sliding. More, more. Slide it. A bit more. Okay, that's good. Now we unscrew it. That's it. Before he opens the powerful water lock, Bruce has to balance to the nearest gram the pressure in both ballast and periscope. Now I balance it with ballast, so the water lock's okay. Now for this, okay. Only now can they transfer the rimacaris. But despite the sloping angle of the system, the periscopette refuses to go down. It looks like one of the valves isn't perfectly aligned. Uh, I think I hit it. I felt like it was going in there. It's going through, it's fine. You got something going on your end? Okay, right, wait, I'll close it. We messed it up once with Gerard. And all three of us were banging on the tube there. Okay, wait. The shrimps can survive inside Baliste for up to four days. In the aquarium, we can control the temperature, we can control the flow and pressure, and that allows us to carry out a lot of interesting experiments. The various experiments carried out using the periscope ballast system will lead to a surprising discovery. 
We'd always thought that the shrimps grazed on the inside of their gill cavity, that it was like a growing chamber and that they scratched at the bacteria there to eat them. But then we found out that the covering of bacteria was never actually scratched or damaged. Unlike the deep mussel, the shrimp does not eat the bacteria in its gill cavity. On the contrary, the research shows that the bacteria actually feed their host just by transferring molecules. The bacteria produce organic molecules that are diffused by passing through the skin of the animal. This must mean that the internal surface of the gill chamber lets food molecules through directly into the creature's blood supply. This is amazing news. Could it mean that there's a direct comparison between the huge head of the shrimp and our own large intestine, which also contains billions of bacteria? Human intestinal bacteria help us to digest. We have our gastric juices, of course, but they can't digest everything we eat. We think it's more or less the same thing for the remicaris. Basically, it's a shrimp that has its intestines in its head. However, the exchange between the Rimicari shrimp and its bacteria goes a lot further than that between our intestines and theirs. A human being has to ingest a certain amount of vegetable or animal sustenance every day, which helps to build up the body's cell structure. The main purpose of our intestinal bacteria is to help us digest our food. They're producing metabolites that we can utilize. They're also breaking down dietary substances like uh, complex polysaccharides that we don't have the enzymes to digest. Um, so they're, they're very beneficial to our, our digestion in that way. But it's quite different for the Rimicari shrimps they don't even need to eat. The molecules they need to survive are entirely provided by their bacteria. It's magic, really. Very well organized, anyway. For true symbiosis to occur, the relationship has to be beneficial to both parties. So what's the advantage here for the bacteria? The shrimp provides the bacteria with a closed cavity where nothing else can get at them to eat them. Well, the shrimp provides them with a home, of course, but it also invites them to dinner. It provides constant access to the sulfurs and other energy sources present in the volcanic streams. The shrimp's going back and forth into the heat, but not for too long. Like, oh, ouch, that's enough, better cool off a bit. But the bacteria get their hydrothermal fluids that enable them to multiply and prosper, and to provide the shrimp with its organic matter. It's a risky business, though. Sometimes you come across shrimps whose shells are burnt and have bits of them damaged. And this is certainly because they've got too close to the fluids and have been burnt by them. Our intestines, too, offer food and board to a vast community of bacteria. They enjoy a safe environment and accept in very hard times all the food they can eat. It turns out uh, that it's actually a mutually beneficial relationship. Scientists have made enormous progress in understanding these remarkable symbioses, but there's still a lot left to learn. How and when, for example, do the baby deep mussels or Rimicari shrimps first acquire their bacteria? 
The researchers have just found the first seed of an answer to this with the Rimikari shrimps. This is definitely a very mysterious creature, and we don't know its life cycle. They carry a few eggs under their abdomen until they have a young larva that can swim, and we find bacteria on the outside of the eggs. It would appear that the bacteria are already there on their eggs. The human fetus, by contrast, protected in its mother's uterus, is completely sterile. The mother's immune system represents an impenetrable barrier to any bacteria. So for us, the whole question of bacteria only starts at the moment of our birth. Early in life, the bacteria that occupied the neonate are generally from the mother's microbial flora, but uh, the developing child, in the case of humans, quickly acquires its own microbiota, and this develops into an adult microbiota during the, the first years of life. Man is just one piece of Earth's great biological puzzle, where it's the bacteria who reign supreme. That's the beauty of bacteria. They can adapt to anything. So that, to them, from their perspective, probably nothing is, is an extreme environment. Bacteria may have been the very first living beings on Earth, but they've never tried to wipe out more complex life forms. On the contrary, they've constantly helped, stimulated, and accompanied the evolution of life. The remarkable success of the bacterial symbioses found down in the abyss have shed a lot of light on the fundamental importance of mutual aid between creatures when it comes to maintaining life on Earth including our own. Here, down in the deep, acidic, burning geysers of the abyss, it's as if hell itself had opened its jaws to show us how symbiosis is the key to the future of all life on Earth.